There's a genetic setup, but um, also the epigenetics matter. Both are equally important. Sometimes the shift is more to one side, sometimes more to the other. And um, as Charlie pointed out today, um, yeah, there's a connection to stress. Um, this is important, which I depicted here in this cartoon. But um, there are also other situations where epigenetics play a role. Um, in 2010, after the Time magazine um, asked why or explained us why we are not, um, yeah, why we are not at the face of our DNA, um, there was a study coming out actually on these mice. On these mice here, and uh, believe it or not, um, these mice have the same, exactly same genetic background, even though they completely have different endophenotypes. These mice have a mutation for the acuity gene, um, which doesn't stop to let the mice. I need a pointer. Sorry, guys. Okay, I do it like this. So these mice here. Um, there, this yellow um, gene doesn't stop, and at the same time, um, what it causes is obesity. And um, how this mouse got lean is because the mothers received a completely different diet, which actually turned out um, to have methadone. It was a B12 enriched diet, and um, what it did was um, to act on the DNA maceration, which we heard about today and um, it repressed the gene that was responsible for this yellow coat color and for the obesity in this mice. And um, so you see there is a lot of power to epigenetics. And also, like, um, if people um, take drugs, um, it makes them age very fast and, and um, yeah, destroys their health, even though their genetic setup is still the same. And even um, doing like dark cycle, the sun and the darkness, and, and induce um, hormones in us and uh, um, determine our gene regulation. And of course it depends if you are this old or if you are a little uh, spread, um, so a squirrel, um, how this um, will affect you. So basically um, what we need to do is um, to get more into these mechanisms, um, how our genes are regulated during all these processes, and for that, we still have to understand the basic mechanisms. And um, as we learned, there is DNA methylation, but there is also, um, as you follow the chromosome and the chromatin, um, it's actually made of these um, little um, toffee rolls here, which are called histones. And um, the DNA is wrapped around it, and um, these can be changed um, by modifications, which I come to now. So basically, um, these histone modifications can determine your gene expression. Um, because there are different epigenetic setups for expressed genes or repressed genes. So you have um, certain histone marks, like the ME3 on histone 3, um, which is related to act transcription. Also, acetylation and the ME1 are related to transcription. And um, there you have an open chromatin, so the gaps are very wide and the genes can be easily accessed and therefore you have more gene products. Uh, in the repressed gene, you have different marks, like um, on the canine lysine, on this little tail. Um, and that leads to a conformation change of your DNA. It's not accessible anymore. It, um, is very, very narrow, and um, therefore you have less gene expression. So, as I pointed already out, what many, <coughs> not so much is known about all these enzymes. Um, so these marks are actually um, put there or, um, by enzymes, which is for the histone acetylation, um, and histone deacetylases that remove it, the acetylation, or the histone acet uh, transferases that actually add these things. The same is for the methylation. Um, you have histone methyltransferases, and you have also the same counterpart that removes methylation. And um, at the moment, there are some studies that 
show how this action is on a molecular level and um, also in the brain. But about many of these enzymes, we still don't understand the function, specifically in the brain, specifically in specific cells that have like neurons. And this is what we went after in this study um, by looking at the histone messenger transferase called MLN1, which at the same time is extremely important because um, two years ago a paper came out um, stating actually that um, variants and also um, splice variants and mutations in the MLL1 gene um, lead to a monogenetic very impairing disease, um, which uh, goes along with cognitive deficits and so on, and it's really severe bodily disabilities. So it's important to study these enzymes more carefully. And we cannot do it at the moment in postmortem tissue because the disease is relatively rare. So we have to go on the mouse model, which we did here. So this is a generation of our mice. It's a very, very big protein with over 3,000, almost 4,000 amino acids. And um, this is how the DNA, or at least a part of it, looks like, the coding part. Um, we have here exon 3 and 4, which are the important parts of the DNA, which code for the gene product. And um, we used the approach, which is very common, um, to generate mice. We clock the gene of interest, and when it binds to a so-called P recombinase, these locks P units are snared out. We use this and have created a knockout. Um, the thing is why we did it, because we can drive the pre by specific promoters in only neurons or astrocytes or whatever we want there. And this is what we did here. We took a neuron a specific promoter to get a knockout only in neuron cells. And um, what you see here on the protein level um, measured by Western blood is that when you look at the knockout compared to titration of the wild type, you get a loss of the gene product, so our mouse worked. Um, the, the same is true here for the genotyping of the gDNA, and most importantly, also the gene product, the scan, um, so specific primers only put um, for the coding region, and you can see it's a dramatic uh, drop or mouse work. And what's always important in these mouse mutants, you don't have a compensatory mechanism uh, of upregulation of ML2 or ML3, which are close variants. Um, if you look at the lizard stainings of these brains, you don't have really gross um, morphological alterations in these mice. So we have a good tool to work with. And um, first, we were, of course, interested to we see anything on the behavior level. And since these people with the MLL um, deletions or mutations had the cognitive deficits, we also first went into this part of um, experiments. And you can measure these things in mice by um, using such apparatus, which measures working memory. It's, um, we measure spontaneous alternations in this ADAM radio phase. And what we actually found is um, we have an increased number of mistakes. And also with another test, which is called the T-maze, where you also measure spontaneous alternations, they um, did this less than white type mice. Um, so even there were below chance levels, so they were very repetitive. Um, very bad performance in working memory in these animals. So they really had a severe behavior phenotype. Additionally, what we also found um, when measuring anxiety, which you do in mice by um, measuring time, um, they expose themselves to open fears um, as um, opposed to dark boxes where they feel safer. Um, we had the knock of mice um, taking longer time to explore. Um, until they explored the area for the first time. Um, they moved less in this apparatus and they also entered less into the center, um, which is the additional part of the phenotype. And then we, of course, asked um, how does it relate to gene expression? Do we find changes? What could explain this phenotype? And also, like, um, what does the mutation do in the brain? Ah, what I wanted to show you also is um, like um, this overlap um, 
with uh, strong impairments in working memory often go together with impaired nest building behavior, which also makes a lot of sense because um, like if you have an impairment in your prefrontal cortex, you will probably not um, take very much care of your home. And this is exactly what you see in patients, you see also in mice. Um, these super impaired mice um, use less of their nesting material and um, yeah, have a higher amount of unshredded nests. So this was, was a completely different unrelated study, but we often see that um, together with this um, strongly impaired working memory that we also saw in our mice. So if you look at the MML knockout, it's almost not using the nest and um, has a reduced nest building score. So it, overall a very strong phenotype that we found and um, so we went into um, profiling the gene expression, gene of light, by the, um, back in this time using microarray studies and um, what we actually found is a whole bunch of genes that were moderately um, changed and also some that were, were very strongly changed. But what was really intriguing was that we looked at the GO categories that everything that we found mapped um, to functions of neurons, like axon, synapse part, neuronal part, synapse. And um, that was very encouraging for, for us that it really has to do something with neuronal functions. And so we went on um, to further look into it. Um, if the um, history modification that MLL um, actually steers up the um, HPK trimethylation, if this is also changed. And we do that by a method which is called SHIP, chromatin immunoprecipitation. So you basically go to your DNA um, and take an antibody that binds um, to this modification and pull out the DNA with that. And um, the more of the mark you have, the more you will pull out. And this is we did what we did then. And um, we only did that on neurons um, by pre-sorting them because we had this neuronal phenotype. And you can see, um, so we did that with staining them and then fact sorting them. There are other methods, but we did that. And what you can see here um, in the neuronal UN stain fraction. So all of the nuclei we get here are really neurons and in the um, negative fraction we don't get any staining. So we have a pure neuronal population to analyze here and um, we are also allowed to do that because we don't have major differences in the number of neurons in our white and knockout mice. And what we did then to get some more meaning out of our data is that we compared um, this uh, ship data, which was also done genome-wide by um, NGS technology. So we took our DNA that came out from the ship, put it on the sequencer, and um, that genome-wide data that we could compare with our RNA data. And um, what we were interested, because this ME3 is a positive mark, um, we were interested in so activate gene expression if we knock it out, we would expect less gene expression, so um, we were interested in those things that were actually downregulated. We found a significant overlap, but only 31 genes. And of those, we looked at the very um, strongest regulated genes, um, which turned to be our very interesting candidates. MICE2 was there, and SATV2 was there. So this is what you actually get, how your data looks visualized. If you look in the um, knockout mice, which is in orange, there's a strong reduction of mice 2, and the same for SATV2, this is the control group gene, where we don't see these changes. So you can really see they have a difference in their chromatin architecture, which also has a consequence in gene expression. Um, this was accompanied also by um, reduction of other histone marks, the ME1, which is also regulated by ML1, um, but only um, or strongest at the place where this mark is actually found, not at the promoter where you don't really have it. Um, also, like acetylation was downregulated because it's another active mark. We didn't find any change in another repressive mark, but um, we found really uh, a strong overlap here. 
And especially the mice too was interesting because um, we found a study also in humans that um, mice too um, modifications are also really rec um, associated with uh, cognitive deficits. And um, then we wanted to know if it's happening in the prefrontal cortex and if this plays a role for the working memory phenotype. And um, what we did then is after checking that it's really expressed in the prefrontal cortex, which you can see here, yeah, it is. And also the microarray probes tell us, yeah, we have mice two and something to do in the brain. And um, what you can see here is after injecting locally in the prefrontal cortex, uh, as I am made, to knock it down, the mice two, we also see the same um, yeah, cognitive uh, memory deficit. And um, because everything was pointing now um, to this prefrontal cortex as an important region, um, we went on and um, actually tested also if you only knock out ML1 in the prefrontal cortex, if you get the same things. And um, so we did that by injecting um, the pre only in the prefrontal cortex to get a localized knockdown. And basically, we find up to the molecular level where mice 2 was then also downregulated in the Nesbelic behavior, we found exactly the same phenotype, so indicating um, this is the prefrontal cortex function, and um, when we used a different knockout, we didn't find this phenotype. And last but not least, we wanted to know if this is also related to other signaling um, functions um, in the prefrontal cortex of these mice. We um, knew that R came also out of the microarray, but first we had to check if it plays also a role for our working memory, because a long-term period has been shown, and so we tested this in, in this uh, in wild type mice, if this has changed, and yes, after 30 minutes, it is there, and actually you need it every day, because you need this continuous attention. And um, so when we went then back to our mice, we found this R in the early genes, but required for learning specifically, um, found actually, yeah, we could verify this result from the microarray. error. It's reduced, and um, after learning, you have not as a strong induction in the um, knockout animals as the wild type animals, so they have impaired signaling. And then we could also show by electrophysiology, um, which shows actually parameters important for um, presynaptic release and presynaptic signaling. So um, fitting to the ARC data, these mice are impaired and therefore cannot, so the neurons don't function properly. And um, so basically, I hope that I convinced you that <laughs> MLL um, as a single gene, as a single system message transferase, um, is important for producing a extremely severe phenotype and um, their, its function is probably very important in the prefrontal cortex and um, important role um, plays minus two for this phenotype. So basically that's it. Thank you for your attention and thank you for everyone that uh, one part involved in the study, um, which is basically main of the study was um, done in Sharon of Aaron's lab and I continue to MPI from psychiatry and uh, my current advisor, Jan Doisig, allowed me to do so, and also my funding allowed me to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We are uh, just on time, but I think uh, if someone has a question, we can have a question before the next session.
we didn't test for anhedonia, so therefore I cannot at this point exclude this story. But um, from the genes that we found um, downstream, I didn't find any classical depression genes. I found um, dopamine receptors lots of change, and they could be related to depression, and maybe it's a completely different system that is also involved in depression. I mean, it could be with as well be. I mean, when I told you already, like when Eric Nessler saw the data, he said, why 